Good evening and welcome to the Monday, November 28th meeting of the Green Bay Planning Commission. Uh, we will get started with a roll call. Chair Lisa Hansen, present. Vice Chair Jacob Miller. Present. Alder Jim Hutchinson. Present. Commissioner Sidney Bremer is not present at this time. Uh, Commissioner Darius Daniels is excused. Commissioner Ken Ravinsky. Present. And Commissioner Michael Paratic. Present. Moving on to the approval of the agenda. Approval of the agenda for the November 28th, 2022 meeting of the Green Bay Plan Commission. Motion so, to approve. Second. The, uh, first uh, yeah. by Commissioner Ravinsky, second by Vice Chair Miller. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Right. Moving on to the approval of the minutes. Approval of the minutes from the November 7th, 2022 meeting of the Green Bay Plan Commission. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Pradic, a second by Commissioner Ravinsky. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and then moving on to regular business. Item number one. Consideration with possible action on request by Green Bay Packers to approve a modified Lambeau Field scoreboard sign. And Sydney is now. Ms. Oh, Sydney. is online. She's here. All right. All right, so for this one right here, uh, as you can see, Lambeau Field, uh, the Packers are asking to go ahead and uh, have a signage change to the north end zone scoreboard. Um, as you can see here, this is Lambeau. Uh, it is in the other public or semi-public future land use, and it is in the um, public property institutional uh, existing zoning. Uh, so right now, this is uh, what the north end zone looks like as far as signage goes. Uh, the Packers look to go ahead and expand the scoreboard itself, and with that, the signage then goes ahead and gets larger as well. Uh, as far as scale-wise goes, it's the same scale essentially as the upgrade of the scoreboard. The scoreboard's going to be improved by about 47%. The signage then gets widened out and expanded about 47%, so the scale stays about the same. Uh, the reason this is coming in front of you is because in the uh, code itself, for any stadiums over 10,000 spectators, um, when it comes to signage changes, this is where it needs to come in front of this board and um, uh, in front of the council for approval. Um, and so uh, for other signage changes, there's been discussions about having some more signage changes in the future at Lambeau. Uh, expect to go ahead and see more of a wholesale sign change to come before you here uh, in the future. But for now, uh, this is for this scoreboard um, upgrade. Uh, and with that, we do uh, recommend approval of uh, the sign exchange. Thank you, Chen. Any discussion amongst commission or questions for staff? It runs counter to my character that I couldn't come up with a question about this. Second. So we've got a motion by Commissioner Bremer, a second by Commissioner Rubinsky. Is there any further discussion? Can I speak just two minutes? Oh, so. I, <coughs> yeah, well, I guess we would. I would make a motion to open the floor. Second. Okay, motion by Commissioner Rubinsky, second by Commissioner Pratic to open the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? If you can state your name and sure, address sure. the record. Jerry Hansen, Staff Counsel for the Packers. I, um, I'm going to make it real brief. I know you're trying to move on with the rest of the agenda, but I thought I'd give you just a little, just a touch of a background what goes uh, on with this signage at Lambeau because we are going to be coming back looking at a, a, an entire package for the entire facility. There is a claims committee. Well, there's about six members to that claims committee. They meet weekly. One of the big things that we have at Lambeau is we're very concerned about the signage and what goes out to the public, whether it's wayfinding and things like that. So it's constantly being reviewed. This sign here for the Lambeau Field sign is getting about twice as big. It's going from 48 by 120 to 48 by 220 on both sides. So the scoreboard is just, it's getting much bigger. The, technical, the technology is going to be better. Uh, it's going to be a nicer view. It's all about the fan experience there. So um, I will be back. I, I thought I'd just introduce myself. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done on the other signage, and we'll bring a big package deal back to you in a, hopefully a couple months. So 
again, if you got any questions, let me know. I have a question. So the reason it's coming before us is the sign is on the outside facing out, right? Correct. If it were inside, we wouldn't be looking at it. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Exterior sign. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Motion to close the floor. Second. Motion by Commissioner Vinsky, second by Commissioner Pratic to close the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Thank All right, so we, we did have a motion on the floor by um, Commissioner Bremer to approve. And a second. And a second. Did we have a second? Yes. I didn't hear the yes. second, sorry. And a second by Commissioner Ravinsky. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and then that will move forward then to the next Common Council meeting, which is? December 6th. December 6th. Not the 20th? No, not the 20th, sorry. It is a 6th, yes. It is a 6th, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, okay. thank you. All right, and then moving on to item number two, <clears throat> which is a public hearing. This public hearing has been properly posted and public notification has been published in the press times. The Planning Commission is interested in hearing public comments on the subject agenda items. We invite your comments and ask that after your name has been called, you state your address, whether you represent a group or association, whether you favor, oppose, or are only providing information in this matter, and your comments or concerns. We also ask that you confine your testimony to facts related to the proposal at hand and avoid repetitive testimony. Questions may be asked during the public hearing, but will not be answered until the upcoming actionable item. You must be recognized by the Plan Commission in order to speak, and please address your comments to the Chair. Comments will be limited to three minutes. To speak during this public hearing, you may unmute yourself at the bottom of the screen. If you're calling it, if you're coming in virtually, you can unmute yourself at the bottom of the screen, use the raise hand function on Zoom, physically raise your hand if you're using the video feature, or press star six to unmute yourself if you are calling in. We will now open the public hearing on item number two, <coughs> public hearing on request for a conditional use permit to allow for continued shelter operations at 411 to 427 St. John Street, submitted by St. John's Ministries petitioner St. John's Congregation property owner. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, this is the location of St. John's uh, Ministries and St. John's Homeless Shelter. Uh, it's 411, 427 St. John Street, right across from St. John Park, a lot of St. John's. Uh, but it's on the city's, in the city's downtown, just north of Mason Street, um, bordered by Jefferson and Madison on the west and east. Um, this is essentially a request to increase the capacity of the existing shelter um, from an 84 bed capacity to 140 bed capacity. Okay. <coughs> All right, so we will open the public hearing on this. So if you want to speak on this item, if you can just state your name and address for the record, if there's anyone here looking to speak, can you come forward and state your name and address for the public hearing? So I'm Cinnamon Harley. Uh, my address is 1198 Canterbury Road in Green Bay. I own the property at 430 South Jefferson. And I guess my questions are exactly how is this going to take place that you're increasing the beds? And is this going to impact the people that are actually sleeping at the pavilion at St. John's Park? Because I'm getting a lot of complaints from my tenants who are concerned about that besides a lot of activity at my own property that is affected by that. So if we're increasing the beds to help get these people homes, I'm for that. Because it is, it's making it harder for me to rent my apartments. So, I mean, I guess details on that, I would be um, more than happy to increase them. I just want to see that also get addressed because it is affecting me as a business owner and me providing safe home for my tenants. Certainly appreciate your concerns, thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Yes. Oh, go ahead, Alder Galvin. Thank you. Um, well, was, uh, St. John's is not in my district. I have quite a few constituents that uh, have business in and around St. John's, or they have uh, quite a bit of opportunity to be driving by. And, uh, and I mentioned to them where they uh, individual owns their home. Going across the street that contacted me 
uh, about increasing the capacity of St. John's. Um, I'm going to vote in favor of uh, any kind of motion to uh, extend or improve the services offered by St. John's. Uh, but the concerns I'm going to be expressing now are from people that are becoming very frustrated with uh, what takes place in and around St. John's because that they're housing uh, the homeless people there. And like the last person that just spoke, um, they have a real concern. Um, one of the individuals I talked to today owns an office building that he hasn't been able to rent or sell. Uh, he hasn't been able to rent any space in two years, and it's been for sale for two years, and he has not been able to sell it. He believes it's in large part because of uh, the homeless individuals uh, that are living in and around St. John's or when St. John's is not open, uh, living in the park and the surrounding uh, neighborhoods around there sleeping in doorways, using uh, restroom facilities, these uh, sites and that. And they, they believe it's adversely affecting their, the value of their property and their ability to conduct business. Uh, in addition, I've had other people uh, recently who have sent a picture after St. John's had opened up on, their, on November 1st of some individuals sleeping within uh, viewing distance of St. John's. And they were expressing concern why they were sleeping there and not in St. John's and why nothing was being done to, to get them into the facility. Um, other individuals, uh, it's, like, like I said, the former St. John's is closed. Uh, the the uh, homeless people that, that do use St. John's tend to spread out in the community. And I get complaints about them being found in people's backyards, garages, um, basements of apartment buildings. Uh, using the facilities at parks, smoking, urinating in public, and things like this. Now, I have been told by some people that when they have called staff to St. John's, they've been told that uh, it's not St. John's staff problem to be dealing with these issues that they're not taking place uh, at the facility. Um, and, and I would have to say technically I, I agree with that, but um, like the individual I was up speaking before is expanding this to 140 individuals just going to expand the problem in the neighborhoods um, and, and how do they plan on addressing it? and alder galvin i don't know if you're this is the public hearing portion of this item so the next item is the action ball so we can have more discussion at that point right. yeah no absolutely no absolutely all your concerns are very are valid so well, and, and I'm just getting out because these are the people that uh, wanted to speak or at least one of their voices for so I'm expressing what they've been coming from. Okay, appreciate that. So, thank you so much. Was there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Was there anyone wishing to speak? Was there anyone wishing to speak? Is that the only screen of people we have? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let the record reflect that no one has come forward and this public hearing is now closed. Moving on to the corresponding actionable item, item <coughs> number three, consideration with possible action on request for a conditional use <coughs> permit to allow for continued shelter operations at 411 to 427 St. John Street, submitted by St. John's <coughs> Ministries petitioner, St. John's congregation property owner. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Obviously, I kind of gave you the location just before. Um, the property has been occupied by St. John's uh, Shelter since the mid-2000s. Um, St. John's Church is to the east of the site. Uh, St. John's Park is across the street to the south. Um, there are commercial uses to the west and to the north of Variety. Um, future, land <coughs> future land use is all downtown, which allows a shelter facility with conditional use permit. Um, and the zoning is the office residential district, which you'll see uh, pretty much all over downtown. Um, and that also allows shelter use with CUP. Go to the next one, John. All right, so this is the site itself. You can kind of see it's a very old site. Um, and as I had mentioned, uh, for about 20 years, uh, about two decades, the site has been used as temporary shelter facilities primarily between November and April. So beginning of November and the end of April. However, there are, have been uh, CUPs that have also been issued for uh, summertime shelter and extended hours and extended times. 
Um, so in 2013, uh, the shelter itself completed some building remodeling, which increased its capacity from 64 persons to 84 persons. Um, so this was partially based on the capacity of the building and also limitations of shelter staff, how many people they could um, service. Um, so at that time, uh, the CUP had an annual renewal. Um, so back at that time, it switched from an annual renewal to a three-year renewal, um, and the capacity was increased to 84. Um, they came back in 2018, um, and those conditions were adjusted to now make it a renewal period of a five-year cycle. Um, again, there were other uh, CUPs that were approved covering some scaled-back operations during the summer. You might be familiar with the COTS program, um, and there were a couple other programs as well. So again, you have over two decades of, of activity there. Um, so the shelter itself targets adult individuals who may not qualify for other mainstream shelter services. As I had said, it's open from November 1st to April 30th. Um, the doors open at 5 p.m. Um, and they operate until 9 a.m., seven days a week. Um, they do have those scaled back summer operations as well. Um, so the shelter itself basically provides a safe place uh, to sleep, uh, hygienic facilities and products, as well as some light meals and snacks. Um, staff focus is really on engagement and relationship building. Um, they are trained to deal with safety, uh, conflict crisis resolution, and other issues that are typical with the shelter. Um, again, the shelter doors open at five uh, each night at 5 p.m. They have expected check-in by 9 p.m. They do have some extended hours, especially if there's extreme weather or, or other conditions. Um, there's always security and support staff on site during all operating hours. Um, and they have a pretty detailed operating plan that was included in your packet. And that goes into a, a much greater detail. Um, so at this time, uh, St. John's Ministries are requesting to increase the capacity from 84 to 140 persons. Um, these limitations have historically and currently um, tie in with staff ability to manage the shelter, uh, but as well as building capacity itself. So some renovations of the property took place in 2020, mainly increasing the number of uh, water closets and uh, laboratories, uh, but also showers. Uh, that increases the capacity of the building now from that 84, it was actually at that time it was a little over 90, um, but to about 150. So they are requesting um, to go to 140, which would meet that capacity. Um, we are going to be putting in our conditions that that be verified through our inspection division. However, I have talked to our chief building official who has verified that the capacity is um, all within code. Um, so, I mean, they could come forward, I guess, and, and add more <coughs> laboratories. They would have to come back and increase if they wanted to go over 140. Um, as you all know, as plan commissioners, conditional use approvals, there are seven um, standards that you use to look at conditional uses, and I have those in your staff report. Um, historically, as all of these CUPs have come through uh, for St. John's um, in the past, there have been a group of conditions that are very typically added to them all. And to be real basic with them, one is uh, operating days, times, and maximum capacity. Uh, the management association, so whether that was the diocese originally, um, Catholic Diocese of Green Bay, now it is St. John Ministries, um, that the city reviews uh, can be based on safety issues typically. Um, the city can review their CUP at any time. Uh, reporting to the Protection and Welfare Committee, uh, regular neighborhood meetings with uh, adjoining area neighborhoods, um, not necessarily the neighborhood that they're in, but adjoining, uh, prohibition of sex offenders, uh, mandatory background checks, uh, maintenance of a history of the residents, approval by the police department and the Brown County Human Services on their operating plan, and then obviously conformance <coughs> with that operating plan. Um, so those are what you've seen through all these CUPs in the past. Um, some of those have been modified. Uh, when staff looked at this request, this 140, we kind of delved into the history of the shelter and, and what's uh, how it's been operating over the last two decades. Um, they have always received their extensions on time, uh, and it is the opinion of staff that the operation has become much more organized and professional from when it started, again, 20 years ago. 
Um, and it does have a proven, proven track record of service and programming. Um, the Green Bay Police Department does agree with that. We have checked with them. Uh, we also believe, we believe that the reporting to the Protection and Welfare Committee as well as the mandatory meetings with neighborhood associations who are outside of the boundaries of where the shelter itself is aren't really necessary any longer and we're going to re recommend those not be conditions of this approval. Um, we don't feel they're necessary. Uh, additionally, uh, we believe that the November to, November to April operating time limitation uh, should also be removed. Um, there have been some summer programs if there's a <coughs> need uh, depending on the circumstance. Um, the building has the capacity and the staff has the operational ability um, that that could operate year-round. Um, however, at this time, I believe St. John's still plans to just operate uh, from November to April, beginning of November to end of April. Um, uh, one area of concern for staff, it's kind of a new one, um, is, as you know, the city itself has three or four large shelters and some small um, transitional housing facilities uh, scattered throughout the community. Um, reporting has always been a, a critical factor for us, especially um, you know, when the Homeless Coalition or the city or the county or anybody starts uh, delving into the, the issue of homelessness. Um, data is our best, uh, best ally, I guess. Uh, correct data so we can get a clear picture of what's going on in the community and the overall situation. Most shelter facilities right now utilize a universal data platform called HMIS, Homeless Management Information Systems, um, to collect all of their data throughout the community so that data can be shared with each other, uh, shared with legislators. Um, um, so that is going to be one uh, condition that we're going to add that's going to be a new one is to use this M HMIS system or other a system that's coordinated, other data collection systems that are coordinated between our shelters. Um, again, primarily uh, to help um, effectively address the um, homeless situation that we have in our community and the surrounding communities as well. Um, so uh, we are recommending capacity increase from 84 to 140 persons. Um, allowing year-round operations and permitting the continuation of the use in perpetuity without coming back every five years. Um, again, I would like to stress that at any time, the council, the plan commission, or the city itself can open up that CUP for review if there's issues. Um, so the five-year mandatory for us felt seemed to be unnecessary and, and burdensome. Um, Alder Johnson, the Alder for this district, the Downtown Neighborhood Association, I am downtown Green Bay Inc. as well as property owners within 200 feet of the property have been noticed of the request. Uh, staff has not received, take that back, staff has received two comments since the writing of the staff report. One was an anonymous call uh, with concern that the increase in shelter beds will increase the amount of uh, people not utilizing the shelter but uh, living in the area. Uh, I think this might go back to some of the parks uh, discussion, people living in the park may not be utilizing the shelter, they're staying in the park um, or in some of the surrounding properties. Um, uh, so this person who had called said that uh, uh, the residents that are not in the shelter itself do have an impact on how school, uh, the neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhoods itself um, and obviously the use of the park by anybody other than the um, residents, so to speak. Um, Alder Johnson could not be here at a conflict tonight, but he did say he, he has read the staff report um, and he has talked to people in the area and other, other um, constituents. And all he wanted to add is he does have concerns um, and that as he sees a higher concentration of homeless people in this specific area, and it may sound kind of obvious, um, but he gets a higher call volume of complaints. Um, so he just has expressed concern that the increase may increase complaints, which I think you may have just heard as well. Uh, but with that being said, staff is re recommending approval of the request to increase from 84 uh, to 140, subject to the seven conditions that are on the screen. So maximum 140 bed uh, temporary emergency homeless shelter, um, with the building analysis being verified by our inspection division. 
Uh, if the temporary emergency shelter facility use is discontinued, the operation is dissolved, or if St. John's Ministry no longer manages the facility, the conditional use permit would terminate immediately. At the discretion of the Common Council Plan Commission, Director of Community or Economic Development, a review may be required by the Plan Commission to ensure compliance with the conditional use permit and identify any areas of concern, including but not limited to police calls, documented safety concerns, or inadequate facilities. Uh, number four, a mandatory background check is required for all shelter residents. Uh, number five, St. John the Evangelist Homeless Shelter staff shall maintain a history of residence for the previous three years and shall utilize HMIS uh, or other data collection platform agreed upon by all shelter facilities within the community. The operation plan would be approved by the police department and the Brown County Human Services. And then number seven is conformance with that operating plan. Um, and the only thing I guess I will add after all of that is this is a CUP for the shelter itself. Um, so I understand that there is uh, concern with uh, sort of the concentration of uh, people in that area. Um, again, this is just for the shelter. So um, obviously if that capacity increase may have an effect that is a condition that you can look at for CUPs. Um, we did not, that's a much larger fish than, than this request as our homeless situation in the city itself. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, but uh, um, so this doesn't really, you can't put any conditions on the park or any conditions, you know, in the community around that. This is really for the shelter itself. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Was that something that the shelter, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Bremer. Um, rather minor question, but just to be clear, uh, does the initial, the first of your um, requirements include the addition of six showers? Um, possibly, when talking with the chief building official, those may not be necessary by state building code. Um, that was an architect's report. Um, so that first condition does include that that's all verified by our, our inspection division. So, yes. So yes it does pretty necessary in my state code, but that would be one of the requirements. Correct. Thank you. Go ahead, Elder Gullivan. I, I didn't catch the name of the uh, gentleman that was uh, just uh, speaking for the city. That was David. David Buck. Um, you're saying that um, your recommendations are to go ahead and increase it to 140, make it 365 days a year, and that uh, any of the um, collateral damage that occurs or could occur from this uh, increase um, has nothing to do with this facility or the CUP. Is that correct? Well, what I'm saying is the conditional use permit is only regulating the shelter facility itself. So if, that in, if it's felt by the plan commission and the council that the increased capacity would have, as you put it, collateral damage, um, that that's something you guys can consider um, in your approval of the conditional use permit. But you can't put conditions on this conditional use permit that are off-site, mm -hmm. so to speak. Okay, so when the city grants uh, liquor licenses to establishments that want to sell alcohol, um, Yet the city is able to put conditions on the issuance of that license based on the behavior of the uh, people that will be visiting that establishment, even if it happens across the street from that establishment, as long as we can directly tie it to that, that facility. Mm -hmm. And I guess my concern here is um, the amount of calls that I get from constituents has not gone down. The amount of homeless people has not gone down. In fact, it's increased. The calls have increased. Um, if you drive by St. John's any time during the year, especially between uh, the end of April and the beginning and the end of October, you see a vastly different uh, landscape around the facility than you have, say, three or four years ago. Um, and I guess my concern is, um, and, and like I said before, I, I've defended St. John's to the hilt all the time. But my concern is, are we having any impact? Are we making any changes? And, and how do we explain this to the property owners around there that 
we're increasing what potentially could be creating more problems for them. And yet we're doing nothing about that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about what St. John's is doing. I'm concerned uh, the city is actually not um, set up to handle people uh, in this capacity. Uh, you know, it's been the police department, it's been the park department. Uh, but what I see lacking is Brown County Human Services. They're the ones that are set to deal with people that have mental health and AODA issues. And a lot of our resistant homeless people are the ones that make use of St. John's facility. 99.9% uh, .9 of homeless people do not want to be homeless. They take advantage of anything that's offered to them to, to make them to, to better their, their, their uh, life. Um, my daughter was homeless for some time. Uh, my brother was homeless for some time. Um, so I, I think I had a little bit more insight than the guy driving down the street. And then my experience as a police officer in the city of Green Bay for 34 years, dealing with numerous uh, homeless incidents over that time period, I'm just wondering, as, as we keep issuing the CUP, what is being done to assure the residents that there are going to be changes? And, and I mean, you, you know, you say the police department's okay with this and everything else, but you look at the calls for service, you look at the people that have quit calling police, they've quit calling St. John's to complain because nothing changes, it seems to be getting better. And, and that's my concern as we increase the capacity of this facility, and certainly if they're asking for it, there must be a need for it. Um, but again, where is Brown County in all of this? And, and, and where is the reassurance that, that efforts are going to be made to prevent what people are complaining about from happening? Okay, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Neil. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, no problem. Uh, Alder Gallon, I think uh, staff certainly shares your concerns, I think, uh, to, to a certain extent. Uh, I, I would say my initial reaction to that would be, uh, so I agree with uh, Mr. Buck's assessment in terms of what, is, what this conditional use permit is, is specifically regulating. Uh, however, I think the key element of that is, is consistency with their operating plan. Uh, if there are residents that are not being, either not either being turned away or somehow not being interacted or being provided assistance, you know, in, in violation of that operating plan, that's a reason for the plan commission and council to to basically take a look at that conditional use permit. Uh, so rather than I, I do, uh, you know, as first I, I first a little, was a little concerned over staff's recommendation to to not do the the time, you know, it, every so often to report back. But uh, I think it really it, by replacing it with by the fact that if, with some due diligence on staff's part to make sure that those things are being met, whether that's a quarterly review or an internal staff review of, of what's being one, making a look at the complaints being received, uh, and from a standpoint to make sure that they are operating as they said they were supposed to be operating. Uh, I think that's that's something we can take, take a look at as, as staff and make sure that they are pursuing that from that angle. Uh, the other option that we're probably gonna need to take a look at is probably needing to change our regulations regarding the uses actually at the park. Uh, if for some reason there continues to be an issue there, there may have to be a strengthening of rules and enforcement of, of certain rules related to the park itself at some point. Now that may not be a popular uh, outcome, but it may be something we may, we maybe need to take a look at in the future. Uh, I'd say it's a city-owned facility. Uh, we control the, the access and options to that, so we may, we may, as staff, be coming forward if there, if there is a very clear ongoing issue above and beyond the shelter facility itself, we may have to take a look at some specific <coughs> actions related to the park facility itself. Well, and I was, and, and, uh, Director Stubbs, I, I understand what you're saying here, but my experience has been that people enforcement actions with people that are almost to begin suffer from mental health problems. So they don't have a county jail, which is not set up to handle people with mental health. They can't pay the fines at the point you get for those violations. So they end up being in Brown County Mental Health again for longer periods of time. Or they're being uh, kind of swept away to other communities uh, for any of these issues. I, I guess this is my main concern. I understand St. John's does kind of provide 
some treatment and outreach to these individuals. Uh, but when I'm going on uh, visits with tents surrounding that area, many of these people are paranoid and schizophrenic. They don't want anything to do with any kind of authority figure. Um, you know, we can go and make arrests, we can take their tents, their sleeping bags, we throw those in the trash, they're going to get more donated for. And then we start finding these people in the bushes along the river. Uh, the encampment we found out there is great with uh, there's a small old community that has been built out there. I mean, so they're sleeping under these bridges. I mean, all these things are going on. I think our main concern is where is the treatment for the mental health problems that keeps these individuals from wanting to take advantage of what's being offered, such as NEW, which is a, a program that works with individuals to improve the issues that they're dealing with and get a man to back out of society. These people, uh, you know, uh, we, we no longer have the facilities to house them, but has there been anybody looking at some kind of housing which is voluntary, which takes care of, care of their needs, but removes them from the community where they become a problem because there's too many temptations. Um, so I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I like what you're saying about enforcement, but again, I see enforcement. I mean, do you agree enforcement means something to someone with mental health? And, and substance abuse issues and everything else, it means nothing to them. And, well, and then we burden the Brown County Jail uh, with these individuals. Uh, but at least they're off the street and they're not harming themselves or harming anyone else. But again, that's, that's not the right place to go either. And I mean, other than that, we something from St. John's or somebody to give us some answers. Or we set up a, a system that when we have the annual reporting, if the numbers start going up, the complaints for neighbors. Do we pull this to your team? All right. I mean, can we put that kind of a thing in? Right. And, and Alder Galvin, all your points are, are valid at this point. I think we've gotten a little off topic because what we're talking about here is going from the 84 to 140. I mean, that's well, all, everything that you're we, saying is valid. I mean, right now. If, if I'm going to endorse 140 beds, if I'm not able to reassure the residents that something more is going to be done to reassure them well, and to stop the problems that they're running into. When people are being accosted going to a funeral in the parking lot, how do we tell them, oh, well, this person's homeless and it's not that big a deal? But it happens time and time again. How do we tell that business not to shut its doors and move somewhere else? Well, if I can uh, add something. So this is David again. Uh, Will Peters is our, one of our neighborhood specialists, I think our only neighborhood specialist. He is here and he does uh, work a lot with the homeless task force uh, for, I believe it's for Brown County. Um, and if he would be willing, if he wanted to, uh, well, his staff. Okay, then that's fine. Um, he kind of talked about maybe more of the global efforts as it does affect that CUP. As you had mentioned, um, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but he would know a little bit more about sort of those broader programs that you were talking about, Alder. Um, so if you would entertain Will. If you'd be willing. Sure. Hey, good evening, everybody. Can everybody on Zoom hear me? Yeah. Michael with you. Yes, thank right. you. Yeah, sure. Uh, Will Peters, uh, Neighborhood Development Specialist for the City of Green Bay. Um, and uh, I would say somewhat of a liaison between the, the city and the Brown County Homeless and Housing Coalition, uh, which I, I serve on uh, and their um, executive committee as a member and then also in their advocacy committee. Um, so very much try to keep my finger on the pulse of, of what's happening and occurring right now amongst our service provider community um, and what's being to, done to address homelessness. Uh, I'd also like to recognize, while I can, um, Jennifer Allen, uh, who is our regional HMIS manager, uh, and then Lydia Van Thiel, who is currently the blueprint manager for um, uh, the, uh, the Community Foundation um, for the, the Blueprint to, to End Homelessness um, as they are well on the line and can serve as resources if we feel we need to open up the floor at some point. But I would like to just kind of pull back a little bit to the, the item here as far as capacity um, because I, I think that there are, though this is all related, so I, I know it's, it's, it, this is a very large nebulous problem um, and what happens with with one um, uh, area, such as currently serving the homeless in, in our sh local <coughs> shelters, to the will impact what's happening out on the street with our currently unsheltered population. 
Um, so to discuss need right now in, in Brown County, um, our unsheltered homeless population is up 235% from where we were last year. Um, currently, new community shelter, last I checked, their max capacity is like 93, I think, 93 beds or 95, and they're at 90, which is a number that they haven't seen in years. I think last year at this time, they were at like 53 out of those 90 beds filled. So there is a, a need right now um, in, 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 in space, in capacity, right? And I want to recognize the tremendous work that our shelters, St. John's, NEW Shelter, New Cap, Safe Shelter, I mean, the list goes on. I really want to recognize and validate the work that they're doing because they're doing tremendous work in our community. But we also need to understand that the, the population, and, and Alder Galvin, you, you mentioned this, and uh, so have others, the population currently that are, are unsheltered on the street that are frequenting St. John's Park are individuals with co-occurring needs, right? So we're talking uh, severe mental health, AODA, um, physical health, physical limitations, right? Because some of the criteria to be eligible um, in a shelter is that you have to be able to provide self-care. And if you cannot provide self-care, whether that is because you are not in the right mind or you physically just can't, you're not eligible. Like our shelters are not set up to be assisted care facilities. Um, many of our shelters aren't equipped to provide the high needs, the co-occurring needs that these individuals on the street do need. And there's also, of course, that small population, which, and I, I say small because I don't have an exact number, uh, which is why it's so important that, you know, we're, we're, we're talking on, on requiring a shared use data system so we all know the population that we're talking about here. But there is, of course, going to be always that population that will refuse shelter. You know, and we have to understand, well, why is that? You know, why, why is it they don't want to, to live in congregate shelter? at St. John's or at New Community. What are their, their needs? And I can tell you there's work being done right now by the HOTS, the Homeless Outreach Team and Basic Needs Team, which is a committee of the Brown County Homeless and Housing Coalition, looking at different shelter models that will better serve the needs of these unsheltered individuals. Um, so one in particular, they're spending some time researching peer-run shelter models, right? So these, these shelters are being run by individuals with lived experience of homelessness because we have, there's been numerous studies and research done to show the success rate of individuals who are seeking help from individuals who have been there, who have experienced it themselves. Um, so I know that that group has set up a separate committee where they actually went down to Milwaukee to tour some peer-run shelter models that exist there to see what could work here in our community to address the needs of this unsheltered population. Um, you know, and, 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 I, and I agree, and we have to also be able to recognize what's not working right now, right? I mean, we've spent the past how many um, years, past few years trying to address um, unsheltered homeless in, in St. John's Park, and if we can't police our way out of this situation, and, and Alder Galvin knows that, the police chief knows that as well. He said that, you know, um, just recently when he was visiting the Brown County Homeless and Housing Coalition Advocacy Committee, that we can't police our way out of this. Um, so, you know, we either continue what we're doing, which is, uh, would be displacing people, displacing individuals. If, if it's not going to happen in St. John's Park, it's going to happen somewhere else, whether that's Navarino, Jackson Square, whether that's on the river. Um, and we need to be more focused about what's going to actually meet the needs and address the needs of our current unsheltered homeless population. Um, so, and I just wanted to, to chime in with just the, the current need that we have that our, our homeless population is increasing, but then there are also groups of, of individuals, professionals who are meeting to actively address and work together to understand, you know, what solutions will will work for Green Bay and the individuals who are homeless in, in our community here. Um, and it's very general, I guess with that I'll, I'll, I'll just step back a little bit to see if there are any other specific questions. Um, but I, I just wanted to provide some assurance that there is that there are conversations happening. That there is not just conversations. There is active work being done to to identify what solution is going to be the best for for our community here and addressing the needs of our unsheltered population. Thank you, yeah, well. Really appreciate the thoughtfulness in all of it. That to know that there's that going on behind the scenes, those peer-run 
shelters that yeah I appreciate everything that you sure. guys are doing right and, and this is Dave again I had wanted Will to come up and speak of that because Alder Gallen, you had said, you know, what's going on in a greater capacity? Again, this CFP is really for St. John's, which is a temporary emergency shelter. That's what St. John's does. Um, that's their prime programming. So, you know, as Will had said, as the population increases, they have the capacity. Again, it's for that temporary emergency. They are not really a, a transitional housing or a mental health provider, um, although they have some staff that's trained in that. Um, it's really just shelter overnight. So, you know, but there are a lot of things going on that they are a part of as well. So I, I guess that's really why I asked Will to speak. I have a question for Will. Um, since you work with our neighborhood associations, we're taking off the requirement for them to meet with the neighboring associations, noting that the downtown neighborhood association right now is not active. Mm -hmm. um, do you see there be value in, in having that or what, I guess what was the rationale for not having that uh, direct affiliation with the neighborhood? Sure. Uh, well, I'm going to, two things. Part of them I'm going to defer to, to David for, for his in, uh, insight on that. But really, I, so I remember attending neighborhood association meetings with Navarino neighborhood, um, and St. John's was there. Right? So they had a representative from, from St. John's at their neighborhood association meeting. So there was an active, positive relationship right now that St. John's ministry has with current existing neighborhoods. Um, regarding downtown, um, I, I can tell you that there have been active meetings between business owners and also shelter providers. Um, I, one of the objectives or goals of the advocacy committee for the Brown County Homeless and Housing Coalition is to put together a, it's essentially a presentation that will educate the community on what homelessness is right now what it looks like and what's being done to address it, and really what role the public can play in that. Um, I, I think we all recognize, and I, I know I'm making maybe making too much of a, a leap here and saying we all, but I think we all see um, the need in our community and the realization this is an issue. And I think we all want to try to do our part to help, but this is a big, messy problem that's not a clear-cut solution to, to end it. Um, so I think it's really important for our shelter providers and our homeless and housing coalition to help educate the public on how to participate, how they can play a role, but then also how to inform, you know, because I think we also can't argue the fact that there are many misconceptions out there around homelessness and what it is and what it looks like. That, that needs to be um, straightened out as well. Um, so, but but I, w having this removed doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have to do it or they, they're not doing it or, that, or they're just doing it because they have to. Mm -hmm. You know, they, St. John's has been having neighborhood meetings and, and trying to establish relationships because they want to be a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I even remember it was when the Engage program came up, um, there were members of their staff that were going door to door to, to provide information and notice and let them know this was happening. So um, I think it's just to show that they've, they've done nothing wrong to show that they, they wouldn't do this or they would be a bad neighbor. You know, I think they're trying to coexist the best that they can with their community and they're a part of our community. And I, I would agree. The uh, main reason staff had the, that condition were recommending that being removed. It was two neighbor associations that are outside of the shelter area. Um, the shelter themselves had been going to the neighbor association meetings sometimes just because and nobody really had anything to say to them. Um, and in reality, um, if any of the neighborhood associations were to call a St. John's and ask them to be there, I've been relatively assured by St. John's staff, now of course staff changes, they would immediately go to any of those meetings. Um, I suspect if they refused, uh, our director would probably open up their CUP for a review at that point, <laughs> um, potentially. Um, so it felt to be really an unnecessary condition, sometimes that the association didn't necessarily want either. Um, I know, again, these were from some possibly 20 years ago, um, so I'm not sure how the dynamics were at that time. Um, but that is sort of a rationale to remove that as a requirement. Go ahead, Dave. Commissioner Bremer. I'm having some difficulty with that rationale. Um, we have required them to have such meetings in the past, even though the particular neighborhood associations uh, are not in the same physical space as St. John's. 
in order to, as I think, an important prophylactic measure in order to cut off problems before they get out of hand. Uh, we are talking about a significant increase in the number of people being served by St. John's, and uh, it seems to me that that is all the more reason to continue that particular uh, connection with the surrounding area. Uh, I'm also wondering, um, I, understand the, I understand the argument that St. John's is not responsible for doing things that are not part of their mission. And I and, and certainly am thrilled that there is continuing uh, and active uh, work on the larger problem of homelessness, particularly as it increases. St. John's has done an incredible service for this city and this county by stepping in to do something that the city and county ought to be doing. Um, but I don't understand how we explain that the establishment, and I'm looking at the third, no, excuse me, the second point under uh, Bradley CDP, that the establishment of the conditional use, in this case the continuation of the past use, but the establishment of a longer time period and a larger population, will not impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of the surrounding property for uses permitted in the district. I don't see how we get around that one and simply say, well, the park is outside of St. John's, so St. John's isn't responsible for the park. St. John, the establishment of this conditional use might very well impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of uh, the park, of the surrounding neighborhood. And I, I really need some help with understanding how we explain that. I share Alder Galvin's concerns about explaining to people who live and work and play in that area. Yeah, and I guess, I, I, and thank you for that. And I agree. I mean, and, and that's where I, I, mean, I was saying, like, it's they're separate, but they're not. Because what, yeah. what happens at one will impact the other. What happens at St. Yeah. John's Shelter will impact what happens at the park and, and, and vice versa. So you almost have to, you, you can't ignore one completely. Um, you know, that, that said, um, the uh, current park director and assistant director for the parks departments, um, Myself, along with the mayor and uh, representatives from Brown County Human Services, are in uh, communication. We meet once a month to really discuss and look at, just to make sure that both the county and the city are on the same page as far as what's being done to uh, address homelessness, what's being communicated. And one of the, the main topics of conversation right now is um, how, how, how are we going to address what's happening in St. John's Park uh, next year? next season, right? Because I mean, we have right now, shelters are open. Uh, They're at full capacity. Um, but we can't expect that come summer in 2023, uh, we're not going to have or experience the same issues we experienced this past year at St. John Park. We just can't ignore that. So mm -hmm. I, I, I wish I had something more concrete to say other than <laughs> we're, we're currently discussing on, 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 on what strategy and what approach to take because again what was mentioned earlier is we can't police our way out of it and we also recognize that uh, the individuals at St. John's Park who are sending up tents in the right of way and under the bridge and in the area um, some of those individuals may not be eligible for shelter or they may even be refusing shelter so then what? I, like, if, if, I think if, if, if we figure out the answer to that or a solution I'm not saying this in a, in, in a, in a way that we can't do it I think we can't I think, you know, Green Bay right now, um, though our homeless population is growing, I think we have the resources at our disposable, at our disposal in our community to address this situation. But I mean, if we can figure this out, I think then we've also just figured out um, a solution to the problem that the rest of the world is experiencing right now. Um, and I say that with pure optimism. Again, I'm not trying to, to, to say this is impossible to address here, but um, I think, I think we've got the right people at the table and, and, and the resources available to um, find a, a, a response to, to St. John's Park. 
Um, because right now, all we have on the books is in our code is to enforce our municipal code of you know of not allowing sleeping or tensing in the park. But we kick out and displace people at the park. Where do they go? They'll just go to the river or another park, and then we'll do it there. I mean, then it's just a continuous cycle. Um, so something has to change. Um, we have to find a different solution. And I, I just all I can simply say is that the city, our partners at the Homeless and Housing Coalition, and the Community Foundation, um, we're all trying to to work as hard as we can to figure that out. And, and Sid, to kind of address your question about uh, item number two of the standards for CUP, mm -hmm. uh, staff did talk about that, and yes, capacity is definitely a part of that. Uh, however, the shelter has been in existence for a couple decades at that location. Um, I guess you could argue it may have impeded the orderly development in the past, um, but we didn't see the increased capacity of doing anything except possibly um, assisting with removing some of the unsheltered homeless in that location because there'd be a bigger capacity in the shelter itself. Um, that is also partially the reason we also thought about removing the um, summer prohibition uh, for that because if there is a lot of homeless people, the summer is when they may need shelter, um, you know, anyway. Um, now again, we don't, as you had mentioned, the city or the county don't operate that facility, so we can't dictate what their hours are necessarily um, or their time frames. Um, however, we didn't see that this increase from, uh, even though it's substantial, 84 to 140 would, would trigger that number two standard to the point where it wouldn't you know, be acceptable any longer. I don't know if that answers your question. That is helpful, thank you. And uh, to him as well. Go ahead, Neil. Just very briefly, um, Commissioner Bremer, I think if, if based on the, work, the, the good working relationship we do have with St. John's, if there are individuals that are related, directly related to this facility that are causing problems in the park, we have a clear avenue to work with them to get that resolved. Um, I think it's, back to Alder Galvin's point, it's individuals who are not either eligible to be in the, in the system or they don't want to be a part of the system that they aren't able to be directly connected to. Those are the folks that I think that according to Mr. Peters, and I agree with him 100%, those are the folks that were, that's the, the, the problem, the, the most visible problem folks that we're trying to figure out how to help. And that's not necessarily, that may not either by regulation or by choice may not be directly tied to this facility. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident that if there was individuals who were having issues in the park that we knew we could directly tie back to what's going on at, at St. John's, visiting with their staff and their operating plan, I think we have a clear path forward to get the, those those particular uh, issues resolved. Uh, it's going to—it's definitely going to be the individuals who may or not be able, if for one reason or another, aren't able to actually be able to access those services at St. John's that are probably going to be the ones. Uh, to Alder Gallon's point, we have to figure out how we're going to provide assistance to because the, the, that, for whatever reason, that that immediate shelter is not able to provide that assistance. So then it's going to fall to other entities and other resources to try to figure out the problem. So uh, again, this short version, just an endorsement of St. John's. They, their, their staff's been very accessible. Uh, we've been, we, I don't, if there are individuals directly tied to the shelter and directly tied to this CUP, their operations here, I feel we'll be able to resolve those very, very quickly. And I would uh, add um, part of what I've been figuring out as we've been going is that um, if St. John's weren't there, the conduct part would be more populated. Yep, that and was Shaft's sure. thought. If they had less beds, there would be more. Yes, indeed. Right. Madam Chair, we've had someone wanting to speak yeah. to the public, so a motion to open the floor. One second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Craddock, second by Commissioner Arvinsky to open the floor. To okay. 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 Sorry to catch you off. Sorry. Sorry, no, I, I, I had comments too. I just I, uh, but <laughs> um, I'm sorry, no, I'm a little off. Uh, so the floor is now open? Well, I don't think we've actually okay. voted. Yeah. voted. Yeah. I I guess I'll, I'll add my comments later. Um, 
All those in favor of opening the floor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. Is that me then? Yeah. Okay, I'll give you a little background. I could I state the name in oh, advance for the record again. Cinnamon Please. Harley, 1198 Canterbury Road in Green in Ashwabanon, and I own the property at 430 South Jefferson. I'm also the president of the Apartment Association in Green Bay. I've been a member of the Housing and Homeless Coalition Advocacy Group for like two years, a little less active because I've had my plate full. And I'm also a member of the Brown County Housing Authority Housing Subcommittee. So I've met with Lydia Van Thiel um, just a couple weeks ago. I had a few ideas on how to address this. I'm not against the, the uh, St. John's increasing their beds, but I've had several concerns when I see children of the high of the little school swinging with these people that might not be acceptable for the to get into St. John's because that's where they go to play. Um, that park was a complete tent city all summer. It was not like that last year. They may not have been in it because it's locked, but they're all around it. There, I've had tenants being accosted in the garages and stuff like that. So I have think Lydia said that they're going to be getting a housing subcommittee as well for the advocacy group which I would like to be part of I do have several ideas on how we can help those that in and when are speaking cannot help themselves because that is some of those people are in that position um, also my one question is for the people who are in the shelter once they've checked in do they stay there do they have to stay there or are they free to come and go I um, I don't think there's anybody from the shelter here no. to answer that question, but I believe they cannot come and go. I think once they're in, they're in. Okay. The morning. Because I bought, the, I've only owned this property for a year and a half, and last year it was not like this. It started toward the beginning of this year, where I'm back there and I'm being surprised by people that are in my backyard, that are in the neighboring backyard. So there is, there is a concern with that. And you know when I see Green Bay crime reports and there are people that are arguing with glass bottles, these are people that we have to reach. And there are some of the things that I talked about. Um, for those that could be in the peer housing group, there are businesses that need employees. You know there are people that are there that they just don't know where to turn. There, are, you know, and I actually started this for to help with Section Eight to help revamp that, which we are making a lot of progress on. Green Bay has the largest um, uh, safe ride program that we've got in the whole state. Brown County does. That's something we can do if we get to taxi companies, they would take vouchers for transportation for jobs. There's the only thing I haven't figured out how to fix and take care of is childcare, and that is a big concern. So other than that, there are ways that we can help those that could immediately get off the street. and. Like I told Lydia, we have tons of ideas. There are so many office buildings. If we could find a way for the city to help lease those, to get showers in there, we could. that could be a transitional housing for those that we can get into places with landlords right away. So, yeah, that was my one question is if they got had to stay because I just, you know, that's where sometimes, you know, nothing good happens after two. <laughs> right. and I, I, I don't see that in their operational plan, right. but what we can do uh, if this moves forward tonight is have that information available uh, to the aldermen and, again, like Alder Johnson, right. who could not be here, who did why. Yeah, here. and I'll touch base with them as well. But, yeah, I had, it took me four times longer to rent apartments this summer due to all those tents in the park where like it takes me a week every other place it took me two months to rent an apartment and they came right out and said it's because of what's going on there my taxes went up because the value of my property went up the value of that property is based on the income I come I bring in if I can't bring in that income I should not have to have my taxes raised thank you Miss Harley <coughs> can I ask a question I'm sorry can I ask her a question sure okay. um, of the complaints that you've heard what percentage would you say are coming directly from the, because you talked about backyards and things like that, what percentage would you say are associated with the park itself as opposed to the surrounding, the rest of the surrounding area? Well, approximately. the yards, like the neighboring yard and my yard, that just started in the last month. But my tenants have had, com they've been complaining to me about what's going on at the park. I would say 75% of the complaints. Thank you. Because they're just they're just concerned. I have a lot of single females, so they're just concerned for their own safety. Or they go in between my property and the other property that would be 426 South Jefferson, I think. 
So they're walking in between there and there's because there's no light there. So it's it's a safety. Thank you. Motion to close the floor. Second. Motion by Commissioner Craddock, second by Commissioner Ravinsky to close the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Got a question on procedure. So if someone makes a motion to adopt and we approve this, are we approving the requested, uh, the subject to lines in this recommendation? Correct. Um, okay. Unless you want to change them, right? And you can you can make the motion with. I'll just use an example: a motion to approve with, <coughs> with uh, the, the first six conditions and a new seven or whatever. Okay. Thank you. Um, because it looks like we're in a situation of dynamic change. Uh, it the situation is dire in the sense we need the room. Uh, the uh, neighborhood is in need of some type of help with what's going on there. I'm wondering if we look at number three, we're at the discretion of Common Council, Plan Commission, or Director of the Community, an economic development or review may be required by the Plan Commission to ensure compliance with this conditional use of permit and identify any areas of concern, including but not limited to. Okay, and then we, there's some things listed there. I'm wondering if we couldn't make it, there will be a review within six months where all these entities, where the county, those committees all combine, because I think we're going to be, com we're going to be compiling data because they're going to have to have that data system, right, inside the building. But if we could combine the data of the police and the calls and everything gets looked at and then we have these professionals who are in the business come and look at it specifically for this area in six months, come up with ideas on how to physically do something to change specific things, then it becomes real. It's not talk, it's not discussion, it's actually committing to fix the bullets that are listed in this meeting. And I wonder, can we, would that be an idea to look at this in, in whatever time frame, six months, and see if we can address these things? I mean, it would be a, it would be a work item. It wouldn't be a discussion item. It would actually be a work item for these committees. It would be a work item for us to make sure it happens, and then we react to it. I mean, you, you could put that condition on. However, St. John's does not have control over any of those other entities. Right, but we know what we're doing with this. We're using this as a rally point. Can, can you do oh, yeah. that and within and this? And like I said, you could put this as a condition. However, you may be putting St. John's at a disadvantage if they can't get the people together or can't gather the information because it's outside of their control then their CUP, they would fall out of condition with their CUP and it would be revoked. It would be very difficult to enforce. I think right. our enforcement mechanism with these would be to bring them back for a CUP review at a certain date. That's, I think, what we could do. I don't know if we can ask those other entities to do that. I think it falls outside our, our control, at least. I think our mechanism, if we're concerned about that, have them come back in mm -hmm. six months for a CUP review. I think that probably is too much, but mm -hmm. I think that's how we could do it. I, I just going to say, Alder, I don't think your request is unreasonable. Um, in fact, that is an action item on our, uh, the blueprints in the blueprint is the requirements um, to report out, to give an annual report out to the community on essentially what, this, what is the status of homelessness in Brown County, what's where, where it's at, what's been done, what needs to be done kind of a look ahead, kind of like essentially a status update is what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I, I think that should happen. I don't think that's too much to ask, especially when we're talking about trying to address a community problem such as homelessness, because it's not just one organization's, one entity's problem to deal with, it's uh, us, all of us as a community. So I think that is, is, is fair to request. However, I don't know if the CUP is the appropriate place to place that request. Like it almost, see that coming out at 
I don't, I don't know. I mean, is that something that would come out of the council floor? Is just in general, like I. Well, this has to go to the council anyway. Yeah, it has right? to go to the council. Anyways, I, I don't think it should be. I don't think it'd be appropriate to tie it to the conditional use permit. Right. That's what I think. The pro I think getting yeah. a little too far outside of this commission. What we can do. What this I mean, body does. We were just talking about signage an hour ago. I think we're getting a little outside our expertise right. and stretching to some areas that we're just not qualified to to be in. I think we recognize there's a problem and the discussion has been great to have but I think mm -hmm. it's outside what we are tasked with doing at this commission which is look at usage and assess that right uh, thank you I, I appreciate that no and you're, you're not you're not wrong it's it's a huge multifaceted problem and we're dealing with the CUP portion of it but there is absolutely other stuff that should be going on and hopefully does go on in the background as well um, I think that did not you know not approving it in my opinion, not approving it doesn't change the need for houseless individuals. And what we're doing by not allowing that is we're denying eligible people by expanding the beds. And it, it's cold out there. I, 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 that's just how I see it. The people still are there. They're not just, if we don't deny it, they're not going to poof and not be there. They are still there. They still need beds. They still need that emergency housing. So the other things that go on in the background with the neighborhood and the park and everything, all of that is valid, but it's not necessarily, it is part of this, but it isn't. And maybe Neil can add something to this. Go ahead. I, <laughs> no, I would just uh, very briefly, uh, I, at really at any time uh, outside of this, I guess my suggestion would be this condition could stay just as it is right now. I, I, would, say, I would say that any time that either the city council and or the plan commission can make a communication to staff to request an update, <coughs> Uh, on all shelter facilities in general or uh, whatever concept, you know, whatever information you guys would like to request. Obviously it's helpful if we know that in advance so we're hopefully tracking the right information and we kind of think we have an idea based on the conversation tonight what you'd be asking for. But I know Mr. Peters and his team are already kind of working on some of this, uh, but I would, I would say that really the plan commission and or the council can make that request of staff for an update report really at any time they would like to do so. So I don't think you really have to do anything specifically here if you didn't want to. Okay, so. okay thank you. Um, how would we then bring in the county? Uh, we can make requests of city, but how do we bring in the county expertise? Um, I would certainly defer to Mr. Peters on that with kind of his network and yeah. his, his group that he's working with to kind of I ask him for uh, additional information and give them, again, specific, you know, a specific request of what we would like them to report back on. Uh, my, my understanding is that they're probably already pursuing a lot of this information anyway, but I think to just give them uh, some notice that we'd like some sort of report back in terms of like their annual status report that Mr. Peters was referring to. Okay, can we, um, can we then ask St. John's to provide the data they're going to get to the plan commission so then we can share and have communication then internally and with the county so um, I, I see maybe I have to do something as an alder in the common council to piggyback onto this where we do convene something because what I want to do is use specific actual conditions that people know about and use the expertise we have to address them. And I see that this isn't the mechanism to do it with the CUP, but we're, we're granting this situation where we're gonna get data. So can we, can we ask for the data to be shared? I guess we can always ask for that data. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's probably the intention of point number five of the, of the report. Is essentially we don't we wouldn't want to be asking them to collect the information if they if they were be sharing. Uh, but I guess to to be absolutely clear, uh, certainly amending that to you know to, to collect that information and, and have that be provided in a format that is it is shareable and, and accessible by the city and the county would certainly be a a, a, a welcome clarification. I guess. Okay. Well, then I would. Well, okay. I would. Do. I'm okay. You could amend number. You could amend number five to just add on a sentence at the back of it that data collected shall be shared with the city of Green Bay. I'd like to add a date, like by June first, two thousand twenty-three. So they, so they don't just see we're going to have to share information. They're going to see a date, 
So they're actually going to get the data. You know what I mean? There's a difference. But this never has to come back. This, this no, this won't come back. But if they have to share data on a date, then it will be worked on, right? It might make a lot more sense for to have that date be like a year from now for them going through the summer. Right. I think oh, we'll will when Yes, yeah, so I'm sorry. I just have a are bunch of thoughts. No, this, are, this is all really good. This is all really good. So, um, re because we do, uh, Sid is correct. Like we need to keep in mind St. John's operating season. Like, because really their shelter season for winter months, their increased capacity is from um, uh, in November to, to April. Um, in the summer, they're operating on extremely reduced capacity, um, and and they have a limit to how many people that they're serving. Okay. Um, but I. I think what's more important, well, say more important, just as important as numbers is context. Um, so I, I almost like, I, I think what we need to see is not just what St. John's is doing to address homelessness in our community, but what all the shelters are doing to address homelessness on an annual basis and what we're doing here. Because I'm sure, again, like St. John's is doing excellent work in fulfilling the mission of their organization as is any other shelter or service provider. They are mission focused. But as to how are we all working together as a community to address homelessness, that's another question. That's something that we, I think we need to better understand and is what that 30,000 foot view looks like mm -hmm. as, as, as how as a community we're addressing homelessness. And I think, and, I, and again, I don't want to, to, to make you or suggest that you need to open up the floor again, um, but you know Lydia Van Thiel, with who's the blueprint, or is the manager for the blueprint and homelessness with the Community Foundation. Um, that's part of what she's been tasked to do, is um, kind of bring all of these organizations together, um, so that we are taking more of a commu strategic community approach to addressing homelessness, as opposed to just uh, leaving it on the shoulders of one organization, one municipality to to bear. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I think what we would need to, I think what we should see is, a, again, some sort of annual report that's given out to the community, out to the elected officials, out to the city on what has been done, what's being done, and what's going to be done, you know, to continue to address homelessness. Just not tied to the CUP. Not tied right to the now. CUP. Okay. And I, well, again, and that's why, so HMIS, so again, and Jennifer Allen is on the call. She is the manager for the HMIS system for this region. So not just Green Bay, Brown County, but a number of other uh, counties throughout the Northeast Wisconsin. Um, that information is, if, if, if shelters are reporting in the HMIS system, and they're reporting then that to, to Jennifer, uh, Jennifer is only a phone call away, and that information is accessible. Like, if you want it now, she can give it to you now, mm -hmm. probably. Tomorrow, she can get to you tomorrow. What point in time, where they're at for capacities, how many they've served, um, and how many people have left or exited services. So, um, and Jennifer can speak to a little bit more about what that information tells us. But that's why we're not making this a requirement of just St. John's CUP, but we're going to make this a requirement of any shelter needing a conditional use permit operating in the city to be using, utilizing either HMIS or a data system that is compatible with all the other shelters, because we need to make sure, again, we can see that larger picture here and how we're making an impact. Madam Chair, Alder Galvin was trying to get in. Mm. Go ahead, Alder. Thank you, and, and I don't need the money to wonder about uh, anymore, and I appreciate everything that Will had to say. But we've been doing this uh, from the, the Housing Coalition, uh, several other organizations, and the focus of the people that I'm getting complaints are are not about the 99.9% .9 of homeless people who are trying not to be homeless. What everyone sees is as homelessness in Green Bay are the individuals mainly associated with St. John's that have mental health and other issues that have been before. These are the ones that have everyone concerned. These are the individuals that caused the, the front area of the Brown County Library downtown to be completely configured to prevent them from causing problems there. That's why we have security guards at, at, the, at the library now. This is why we have um, private businesses all over the downtown area that have restrictions on these individuals coming into the facility because of the damage or the collateral issues that they cause. This is what people care about. I'm not concerned about any of you or any, really any of the other issues. Having your data 
the compiler of St. John's, I think, is an excellent idea. Having a yearly or bi yearly report is an excellent idea. The Greenwood Police Department, due to staffing shortages, pulled almost a third of its community police officers. These were the individuals that were dealing mainly with the homeless people in the areas on the near east and near west side, and also on the far east side, because at one time they were able to track them going all the way out to Walmart to obtain their liquor because they found ways of getting around the system there. So, you know, I, while, while I care about homelessness, you know, in the large thing, I'm more concerned about this one small percentage of existing people. And what are we doing? And it's, again, Green Bay doesn't have the organization or the monies to deal with homelessness. Yet it's Green Bay Police, it's Green Bay Parks that are doing the brunt of the work on this, on this issue along with the NGOs. And I keep asking, where is Brown County in this? And I'm told that we've got one or two people assigned to this. And I'm like, but where are the facilities for treatment? Now, what are the things that are going to help these people overcome their obstacles in life and have a better life for themselves? You know, and, and I think getting information and data and showing how many of these individuals are, are involved with the police, the ERs, fire rescue, you know, I mean, there was a, a, a real famous book that was done years ago about the billion dollar man, about one individual in a community that cost the community over a billion dollars in, 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 to be treated because they, they weren't doing it the right way and they weren't working together. And this is what we have a lot of involved here. We have a lot of the NGOs, we have a lot of government agencies working with a small group of people, but all coming from diverse areas. And we're ending up with a muddled mess. And well, nothing is changing. Sure, yeah. Nothing right, is yeah. getting better. And that's what I'll, people want to see. They want to see change and they want to see things get better. And so I'll, we're requiring a, a new meeting or, or, or report or something like that. I'll, I'll go for it. Right. Absolutely. Madam Chair? Yes. I would um, note that the discussion has been very interesting, but to get back right. to the original proposal here, which is simply talking about the number of beds, right. um, and to your point as well, um, if we were to say no to this, <laughs> the, the problem will not go bad. away. And we're at capacity, we need more beds. These are all great community conversations to be had and continue. And I think some of the requirements that um, Alder Hutchinson has said belong somewhere in the city mm -hmm. in a conversation, just not here uh, with the matter about the beds. So I would make a motion to approve uh, the request as presented with the conditions. And I would also add an eighth condition that they meet at least annually with the Downtown Neighborhood Association. I would second to clarify on that point, that eighth condition. There is no downtown association. It's just right going to add. They're not going yes. to so, active. But if there is an active. If, 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 if at some time it becomes active. Correct. We, and we could well, have a meeting with Astor Neighborhood Association. That's where I get most of my complaints from. I mean, Astor is pretty close. But was that one of the ones that was required, I assume, before? Prior. Yeah. Uh, prior it was Astor and Prior it was well, Astor and Navarino. So we would just mm -hmm. keep that then. Could we add in the to burn the burn the bids with this, but the, the probably the face of those districts at this point, at least downtown, as being involved in those. I mean the, I don't know if the business district they're the face no. of it though. I feel like there needs to be a bid board but yeah. for this situation. Yeah. I just with all like, the different homeless shelters and everything else. I would so. like to just identify some sort of downtown stakeholder. I just don't know who it is. Right. Well, downtown Green Bay Inc. would be the closest. That's, That's all I can think of. I think that would be very appropriate. Well, maybe the Association. Those are other people that need to be What? I guess we missed it. What did he say? He said the Apartment Association. Uh -oh. But we would be requiring <laughs> them to be going to their annual meetings. It's a, it's I don't know. I think it's fair, I which we can't do. Like, right. we, can, like we can direct a bid, which technically right. falls out. We, can direct, we can't direct something that falls right. outside. Correct. Right. It's like I like this annual meeting idea, but how, how are we necessarily the appropriate? No. I don't. To be I, honest, no. I know we aren't. We're trying to shoehorn something in here right. because there's, I think, there's feelings because about we, it. Right, we have feelings. We want to try to figure out, but I think this <laughs> is probably best taken up by council. To be honest, however, 
they would like to. Well, and, and with the with this UP is with Act 67, it's what we find reasonable. So, but it's you know, we can have. Well, the in the past to require such meetings. I don't see any reason that it's not appropriate now. With Navarino and Astor and the uh, downtown, um, Green Bay downtown. There's business. And the, and the uh, partner association, if you want to add them in as well. Well, we don't have any jurisdiction. Right, that's right. That's right. That's right. right. I think the word right. 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 The, and the we're reaching, I think. The, and the neighborhood associations okay. are recognized okay. as the city. Makes sense. They're yes. part of the city. Let me just, right. I think, right. they're independent, but they're recognized by the city. Right. Correct. I think Should that's the best option at this point. Yes. So right now, so the most of the neighborhood Okay. Yeah. What I have right now, for if I can read it back to you, for the additional number eight, is uh, St. John's will meet annually with the downtown Astor and Navarino neighborhood associations, if active, as well as downtown Green Bay Inc. Do we, do we, I don't know that we have the jurisdiction. Do we? Or well, we have, I mean, what are we asking out of it too? We're asking right. to meet, but are we asking for accountability as in like a report from the meeting right. or availability to it? We got to be more specific here, otherwise we're just. What was done in the past? Uh, in the past, usually it was just a uh, discussion. To, to be frank, it was uh, the neighborhood uh, bringing out their issues to St. John's, which may or may not have been part of St. John's operations. You ever been to a neighborhood association? Sometimes the comments go all over the place. Which was probably staff's opinion why neighborhood associations that are outside of St. John's um, weren't necessarily needed yeah. to be met annually. Um, and again, as I had mentioned, when I talked to St. John's, they said they would never turn down an invite to a neighborhood association if they requested them to be there. And, um, and my motion was just for downtown because of that. It was I didn't mention the other ones for the reason right. of that it's in downtown. I think that some of the community concerns could be addressed potentially um, with neighbors and residents in the area um, from those types of meetings, and that would help move the conversation along. I, I didn't make the motion to clarify for the other associations or the downtown. I think I added that as the I was, I was yeah, adding yeah, that. Yeah, so, so, so let me, so let me, it would be meet annually with downtown neighborhood association at Yeah, because they're Correct. in. Because that is, that is the neighborhood. And I would hope that uh, other similar shelters would meet also with, with their neighborhood associations, but that's not what we're discussing today, so right. that's whatever. And I think not to have them attend all, at, in full disclosure, I'm a president of my own neighborhood association. I think that having them come to all the association meetings is a bit, overkill but I think at least once and if they choose to come to other events and meetings that's that would be great but I think just to at least once a year to have an opportunity for them to interact face to face to be able to have those concerns addressed and they know them and, and they know the concerns of the, the <coughs> shelter as well so that was the rationale for the motion and that still has my second okay was there any further discussion we have a motion by Commissioner Pradic, a second by Commissioner Arvinsky to approve with the conditions and the added eighth condition. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and then that will move forward then to City Council for December 6th. All right, and then moving on then to item number four, which is a public hearing on request for a conditional use permit to allow shelter operations at 430 South Clay Street, submitted by We All Rise African American Resource Center applicant on behalf of Transformation House, Inc. property owner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is another CUP for a shelter facility. However, it is quite different of a shelter facility. There is an existing shelter located here at 430 South Clay Street. Uh, to just give you some bearing, South Webster is here at the intersection with East Mason Street. And this is that large apartment complex that faces Webster. Uh, this went before the Plan Commission in 2018 for its first approval for that CUP. This is more being seen as a transition to a different operator versus the establishment of a new shelter, but we will get into those details during the actual item. Okay, all right, thank you so much, Steph. So now with this public hearing, we're looking to hear from people who are looking to speak in favor, 
in opposition or looking to provide information only. And if you can just state your name and address for the record um, for this public hearing. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Answer questions or just well, this is the public hearing portion. The next item is actionable. So, it if you want to say something now, you're certainly welcome to come up and speak now. I want to introduce yourself. Hello. Um, should I just? I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Robin Scott, Executive Director at We All Rise, and I live at 1244 Cherry Street, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Was there anyone wishing to speak? Like all the Go ahead, Alder Galvin. Alder Galvin, we can't hear you. It's coming in really garbled. Can you hear me better now? Yes. There we go. Perfect, sir. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, it, it was considered a space open up uh, as a shelter. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of opposition in the neighborhood about it. Um, and I think that over the time, the neighbors realized that the way it was run, it was actually more of an asset to the community than, than anything. Um, and I think all that happened right away. Don't you have to here? It looks like it's pretty much uh, the same kind of program that we before. And I have not had anyone contact me in opposition uh, to it. And I myself am in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Is there anyone wishing to speak? Let the record reflect that no one came forward and this public hearing is now closed. Moving on to the corresponding actionable item, item number five, consideration with possible action on request for a conditional use permit to allow shelter operations at 430 South Clay Street Submitted by We All Rise African American Resource Center applicant on behalf of Transformation House Inc. property owner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so again, location here for reference. Our future land use map shows this area for medium high density housing uses. So the CUP application is compliant with our uh, future land use map. The zoning is office residential currently, which does require that conditional use permit to establish or reestablish a shelter facility. Um, this is just a street giving you an idea of what the property looks like. I believe this used to be a nursing home many, many years ago. Um, so it's a three-story facility, um, a lot of single rooms in here. There was a floor-by-floor -floor layout attached within your packet to give you a better bearing of how the property looks on the interior. They've also included a site plan here that kind of gives it a, how the existing site plan is set out, including the parking and then the size of the buildings and the layout of the building. Uh, generally speaking, we are in favor of this. We did put in the staff report um, some background information about the transition from Transformation House to We All Rise. It looks like the programming is very similar. Um, it seems like there is just a branching out at the We All Rise Center. They already do a lot of nonprofit community work, and this is uh, kind of like the next step for them. This is a um, fully occupied shelter, meaning this isn't just for overnight stays. Um, they would have tenants at this shelter facility that require case management as part of that intake. So there's a screening process, an intake process, and then you are, you know, requirements to be on the program and staying at that housing. It is an all men's shelter, which it was um, with the previous ownership as well. Um, I'm sure that Robin can detail any additional changes that may be occurring, but from what I can tell, this is a transfer of ownership of that shelter facility. Um, some of the things that came up as part of our review were many of our code sections give a lot of detail to what needs to happen at these shelters. So I included most of that language in your staff report. Um, almost all these standards have been met or would be addressed during site plan review. One thing that was not detailed within their application packet was the capacity. So we calculated the capacity based on the parking that's available for this type of shelter and put that at a maximum of 45. Um, that's one of the conditions here that it could be reduced during the site plan review if the building capacity is smaller. Um, we do have right here that any decreases could be approved by our zoning administrator and increases would be approved by Plan Commissioner Common Council, which we usually have for our shelter facilities. 
From there, a lot of the language is the same as Dave went over. Again, trying to streamline this process, make sure that we have really thoughtful conditions with these, enforceable conditions with these, and things that are compliant with our conditional use permits. Um, so if it's not being owned or operated by the rise, that they would require a different CUP to be established or reestablished. Again, at the discretion of the Planning Commission, uh, Common Council, or our director, that they could have a compliance review of that CUP. Mandatory background checks, um, the same at HMIS system. Uh, we're going to be adding that as a condition for all of our shelters going forward to make sure we have that same reporting information. Um, the operating plan as submitted, making sure they're conforming to that. Um, our basic language, they have to comply with all their municipal codes. And that the site plan be reviewed by our community development review team. Um, that's really to make sure that all past city issues are being addressed through fire, building code, and then through our zoning code. Um, so with that, we are recommending approval with these conditions. Okay, thank you, Steph. <coughs> Is there any discussion amongst the commission or questions for staff? I know, I was waiting for Sid, too. <laughs> Go ahead, Commissioner Bremer. Take yourself on mute. You're on mute, Sid. I've almost got to turn the door. The only question I have would be uh, for them uh, having to do with whether or not there are any changes in the operations. All right, so we should open up the floor. Uh, so for that purpose, I'd like to uh, move to open the floor. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bremer, second by Commissioner Pratic to open the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Come come yeah. okay. I appreciate you introducing yourself earlier. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so programmatically, um, I don't see there being significant change in um, the day-to-day -day operations at 430 South Clay Street. I do think that um, operations, rules, all of those things have been in the works to be updated. I think in addition to that, we have um, and plan to continue to work towards um, a lot of what we talked about earlier, um, making sure that clients that occupy um, shelter at our facility are able to receive um, an adequate um, amount of resources and community that includes mental health supports. Um, that won't happen on site uh, at Transformation House because of the, or at All Seasons Transformation is what I'm proposing um, the name change to be, but because of insurance practices and the agency that we currently have being We All Rise African American Resource Center, we went into the secondary market and have already secured the um, correct certifications and insurances for um, that facility. And so it's literally a three minute walk um, for those clients to be able to, if they are survivors um, in any capacity, receive those free um, comprehensive uh, mental health services. In addition to that, there you know be changes such as um, we want to get to the capacity to be able to serve three hot meals a day, um, and then making sure that the secure like the facility and the security plans. Um, will allow for the safety of the residents. And so there's a lot of updating in terms of blind spots that we've identified at the facility, um, making you know some outer appearances, things like that, that we have to get into place. But programmatically, I don't think that there's a lot of changes that we're looking um, to enact. How about uh, with your target uh, clientele? I think that's a great question. And so we all rise, we've been around for a while. Um, we've grown mm -hmm. uh, pretty quickly, um, and we support the most marginalized folks in this community. And so while our focus population is black folks, I feel like um, when you come to our agency, what you'll experience is uh, the most marginalized people receiving the same degree um, with the same level of integrity as all other community members. We don't turn folks away. Um, right now at Shelter, which is, I wouldn't say at capacity, that is something that I wanted to talk about, but... Um, Right now, I would say it's a uh, majority Caucasian residents, um, and we're not looking to change the natural flow of those that come to receive our services or those that are referred. 
um, to our services. Is there a particular connection between your earlier work or your continuing work with uh, Mayo News uh, and the notion of trying to serve uh, folks who age out of the foster care system? That is another really great question. And so, yes, um, we've, it's pretty public that the African American Resource Center, the reason why we established it is because of our initial work in this community with youth. And um, from our youth programming, we grew into the African American Resource Center, knowing that in order to best support the young people, um, we had to be able to provide the same sort of supports and services to their parents. Um, what we've identified being a huge need in homelessness um, in our community has been a couple different populations actually. One being aged out foster care youth. Um, it seems that they go in and out of shelter and that there are multiple different um, conflicting life circumstances and needs that aged out foster care uh, young men have that we feel like we're uniquely positioned to provide because we have been. Um, in addition to that, we, we see, you know, veteran populations um, that are outside as well as male identifying um, LGBTQ folks that we feel like have not felt and found full safety at other places um, and they s receive the walk-in services that we're able to provide, um, but we'd like to have a facility that allows for the comfort um, and for all different folks that I've identified male in our facility. Excellent. It's very ambitious, but you've got it clearly targeted to confidence. Thank you. You did say you wanted to raise a question about capa uh, oh, capacity, capacity, however, and I wonder if there's anything else you want us to be aware of. Um, so that, well, there's so much to be aware of. <laughs> it was like a, a big place, right? Um, so in terms of other things to be aware of, uh, with the transition that we've been you know, in for the past six months, we have done um, what we can uh, with what we've had to get the building up to you know, fire code and inspections from um, was it the fire department and you know uh, trying to streamline like the folks that are using services or that are um, giving those services at our agency um, so like we don't have vans doing one thing and someone else doing another that we're able to work with one company to be able to come in make sure that um, all the different systems that will keep the residents safe um, and like streamlining that process. We've also uh, compiled multiple different recommendations from companies. Uh, we try to get three bids from and comprehensive plans of safety. And so we've reviewed all of those to say, you know, when do we expect fire alarms? When do we, um, how do we stay on an annual plan to make sure that volumes are working in the buildings? What does an intercom system look like? All of those things that we've evaluated. Um, and we're working on that. It is a lot. Um, and it is very ambitious of all of us, the team of folks that are, you know, a part of doing this work. But um, we feel like it is an initial part of our mission. It lays it out there that housing and being a part of that is something that we've always, you know, really felt passionately about. Um, the 45 capacity, I didn't know the parking lot thing, so I guess I didn't appropriately count spaces in the parking lot um, but we were composing a capacity of 49 being that we have one eight bedroom that we feel like meets the requirements uh, three rooms that have two beds one room with three beds and 32 single occupancy rooms and the three um, stories and so four more um, being that it's really important the eight bedroom allows folks to come in on intake and during that period so at shelter facility, there's a transitional point that folks go through, and that is they're able to live amongst other men. They're able to, you know, take care of their hygiene. They're able to get on um, a consistent routine of meeting with the case manager and other leadership, and then they're able to attend those house meetings. And then what we now are working on is those um, other pathways to success that we'll have both in-house and then outside um, of the facility 
on a referral basis. And so that eight bedroom is really intricate to being able to properly observe the men, the men amongst other men. And so we want that room to exist. In addition to that, the three rooms with the two beds allow for folks that are in wheelchairs um, and then have other needs that are more private rooms that are on that first floor. And right now we do not have a fully operational elevator in that um, in the building. And that ranges from $40,000 on up. Um, and there's also not many people that can work on a system of that magnitude that are, that are local. And so we need those beds to be able to um, meet the needs of the homelessness and the population that we're serving. And also, not a lot of residents have cars. While we are seeing people that are getting their first cars for the first times, um, our parking lot is rarely over three cars as we require them to have proper registration, license plates, and insurances. Thank you. Well, is there any, any other questions for the applicant? I have a question. So, but, in but, sorry, that oh. it doesn't exactly work. Oh, like that. not me. <laughs> sorry. So, oh wait. Thank you so much, Robin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you have a question or some? Or Just okay. a question for her. Like, oh, well, if you can address your questions to us. Oh, okay. To okay. I'm Cinnamon, 1198 Canterbury. Um, so I guess my question on the program, because it seems like they've got a good footing on getting people like ready for success and to get back into like regular housing and stuff like that. With some of the case management, do you do like Red Smart? Oh, sorry, Red Smart program and stuff like that. And do you know like how far do they go to help these people to get as, more successful? As far as what other programming? Yeah. Have? All right. Thank you. And if you could answer that. To answer yeah, that. Um, so yes, we have done Rent Smart. Um, we have done home buying education classes connected um, with local sororities and fraternities to um, put those classes on both at our agency, but also have had multiple referrals to you know different resources that are out in community. Um, I feel like it helps. Workforce development initiatives. Um, a lot of times there folks are like you got a couple things going on it is really the you know us just setting our clients up to <coughs> connect with the right resources i know that there's over like 800 registered like nonprofits in our area as well as we're one of the resourcefulest communities that i've ever lived in and so it's not very um difficult to make the referrals to those programs or to have them come on site where we know that our clients are already comfortable and um deliver the literature and information and knowledge directly to our clients on, you know. Yeah, Motion to close the floor. Second. All right, motion by Commissioner Pratt, second by Vice Chair Miller to close the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Staff, do we have an issue with moving up to 49? Mm. I don't see any. Um, we have to determine the capacity based on the building also anyway during site plan review. So if procedurally the plan commission and city council approve at a certain number, if we have to reduce that base of building capacity, we're going to have to do that regardless. So if we want to approve at a higher number now and then just figure out the details during site plan, I'm okay with that. I like that. Yeah. Okay. And there, so there is, a, I guess I just, there is a set requirement for parking at shelter facilities. I mean, like, because I've, I've known a few people who stayed at Transformation House and they didn't have cars. Um, I will defer to John on this. <laughs> 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 so the different types of facilities require different types of parking. Um, you know, we obviously know that if it's geared towards kids, like, there's not a parking requirement with that aside from staff. Um, so, I don't know if you want to expand yeah. on that, John. I can take that. It's one stall per five residents mm -hmm. and two stalls per every three employees at the largest shift. And that's how we get to 45. <laughs> I'm mathing. So that's a fun formula. <laughs> but that said, they, that was us looking at 
So we did not have that actual site plan right there. Okay. If they can go ahead and put it in. Or if they can, then we'd reduce back down to 45. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we can have that to Thank 49. you. And that then be also deferred to the site plan review? Okay. Yeah. It's still in there, though. Yeah. Good. I would make a motion to approve. With the exactly. with the changes oh. that <laughs> sorry right. so then uh, we would move up to, <laughs> so we would move forty five to forty nine right. mm -hmm. and we would add an item I just for consistency that would require the organization to meet with the Joannies Park neighborhood at oh. least once a year. Look at us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll still second it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a question for clarification. Sure. We're requiring um, that they meet with a specific neighborhood, but should it really be with whatever the associated neighborhood is in case the lines change or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. in case the neighborhood association I didn't touch it on the last one, and I just thought change. through that. Sure. I, well, sorry. With the corresponding lines. neighborhood association mm -hmm. that they are involved with. The right court and wordsmith that. Just in case, you never know. Got that stuff? Mm hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Are you okay with that? Yeah. That's on okay. her writing. Okay. <laughs> we got a motion by Commissioner Craddock and a second by Commissioner Brummer. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. And then that will move forward into City Council for December 6th. Moving on to informational director's report. Mr. Stickschulte. You're on mute. No. <laughs> 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 out of sake of trying to be brief, I was going to be too brief, but you didn't hear me say anything. Uh, I really just go for one more board. I was just trying to, staff trying to wrap up here for the end of the year. Um, mostly, you know, still kind of keeping our all existing projects moving along. Uh, we'll generally really just open it up if anyone has any questions about any active projects going on right now. And I'll do my best to answer them if anyone has any questions. What, what's going on on, on downtown, the Cherry Street, and the... I was going to say, Neil, the, do you want to address that? development by, you know, by the post office over there. Oh, that one. I was oh, that's the one. Oh, I was talking about what, what, R, no, what RDA has tomorrow. Oh, what does RDA have? Oh, okay. Well, I could, we can answer both of them. First off, uh, the, the downtown Cherry Street one is we have that development agreement has been signed. Uh, we believe that the developer will be getting east finalizing uh, engineering plans right now. Suspect that they will be moving forward with their redevelopment project probably as soon as the weather breaks in the spring. Ooh, excellent. That's good news. Very good, news. Very good news. All right, and then your question. Uh, you know, I should just tune into RDA tomorrow to <laughs> get my answer on that. I'm just a little confused at how that popped up, considering what what plans we've had in the past for that area. It does not seem to be in alignment at all with that. Which which plans are you referring to? Uh, the downtown master plan from the 2014 authentic authenticity plan. That's cool. Okay, so you're referring to the Bay Lake City Center building? Yes, sorry. Yeah. That, yeah, absolutely, though. That is one of the items that is oh. being, uh, uh, will be discussed and will be discussed in the context of that downtown authenticity plan. Um, essentially, at this point, there's been no, uh, no, I guess, no tangible uh, plan to come forward in terms of how to redevelop that site and kind of reestablish the street grid and all the things that are identified in that plan. Um, as such, that building is currently owned by multiple owners. It is a condominium association. I believe there's like up to 16 different owners in that building right now, uh, which makes obviously redeveloping that specific structure even more complicated with all the different owners. Uh, so right now, the, what is being proposed uh, is essentially uh, converting a lot of that space into into more of a, I guess, a lower a lower level more affordable market rate project. So uh, about 70 units is being looked at on both the first and second floor. Uh, it is a unique uh, project, to say the least. So we are going to be taking a look at that from an RDA standpoint, particularly in the context of how it affects the redevelopment of the uh, parking lot that's right next to it. That's eventually we'd like to see that be uh, a redevelopment site as well. So uh, the request from the developer is to kind of uh, basically doing some cleanup types of activities on that site that would allow them to move forward with the development, uh, some vacation of some right-of-way, 
um, establishment of a no-build easement to allow them to meet, meet code, uh, and then actually transferring this one corner of that existing the old mall building, essentially, that is still owned by the RDA. Uh, so essentially, we'd be transferring ownership over that would allow them to proceed with that project. Um, so that's, that is what is being discussed at, at this point. Uh, the, the building remaining there it is, as it is, is I think, you know, certainly uh, there's been a lot of discussion on both sides of the issue. Uh, it's a, certainly an opportunity to, to add more housing units to the downtown area, which we think is a good thing. Um, you know, that, that particular building is, there's a lot of folks who have strong opinions about it both ways, uh, in terms of whether it should stick around or it should be taken down. Um, so that is one thing that, you know, at this point we're having a discussion with RDA to see what they are, they are interested in, in kind of working with the, the current owner on pursuing that particular reuse for that site. Just very interesting. One other question I'll let you off the hook then. Sure. Um, I swear we put out RFPs on the Adams Street lot maybe last year, or am I imagining something in a COVID haze? Yeah, well, 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 I think it was about two years ago, absolutely. And that obviously resulted in nothing tangible. There, yeah, I, my understanding was before my time, uh, Jake, but it was essentially, I think the proposals that were brought forward were not, they, they, no one was really, an RDA, and I don't think council was very excited about what was brought forward, um, just in terms of, not only the use, but in terms of also the amount of assistance being requested, it was it just there just wasn't really what was going to move forward uh, in that particular climate. Time's probably right right now. I think ideally, in a perfect world, I would I would love, to, my own personal opinion, would love to bring a project forward to maybe potentially redevelop that whole block. Uh, would be really, really fantastic. Um, you know, market realities, we may not be in a position to do that uh, without some severe capital outlays uh, to make that happen. So we don't know if that's going to be possible or not at this point. So this at least would be allowing a, a, a more, I guess, a more functional and I guess meaningful reuse of that building uh, at, at the very least in the short term. But I don't think it's, it totally means that we would not pursue uh, eventual redevelopment of that particular site. Hmm. I lied, I got one more question. Um, <laughs> so we're doing master plan update, ongoing or soon to start. Um, when that gets put in place, will that then supersede the downtown authenticity plan or will they kind of work together? I'm just trying to remember the cadence there. because the, Oh, that's a great question. The old uh, master we'll, plan we'll, we'll was- We'll be doing first and we'll be kind of evaluating all of our existing uh, plan documents that have been adopted or, or that are in effect in one way, shape, or form. Uh, to kind of use that as kind of our baseline to start updating the plan from. So I would say that those things would either be incorporated into into the plan if they're determined to be still appropriate and applicable. They will be incorporated into the current plan. Uh, otherwise, they will be you know amended and updated and probably worked into the newer document. So it could go. I would say it could go either way. Um, my my guess is that they will probably be built upon and expanded. Those specific. Um, uh, plan documents such as that one would be incorporated into like a, a downtown specific section and probably modified and updated a little bit to maybe reflect current uh, current desires of the city at this point. So they would they'll be used as a starting point, but but my guess is that uh, as the document gets finalized. Awesome. Thank you for the, the answer. I appreciate it. Sorry to no. oh, bring it out. I was one open bit who let Vic told you to ask questions. Remember so. <laughs> His fault. I just love master plans, all right? <laughs> all right. Thank Talking you very much. the right crowd. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The words we don't hear all that often. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then thank, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Neil. The date of the next meeting, December 12th, 2022. Motion. And I will hope to be with you in person then if I can get this voice off my hand. Okay. Sounds good, Sid. Sounds good, Sid. Hope to see you. Yeah. yeah. You got it. I think Bye, so. everybody. Second. Motion to adjourn. Second. Yeah. All those in favor. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Uh, recording stopped. Yeah. So wait, what? Yeah. Recording. They're going to be Boston store again?